regarding your own biographies, I'm curious, how did you first discover Spurgeon, so to speak? Um, before we even get to Spurgeon himself, how did you come to Spurgeon? Because I'll tell you, for me, Spurgeon was kind of this music that was always in the room, but I maybe didn't always know how to appreciate it, whereas Luther was like a theological bomb that just went off, and everything after there was Matt Hall pre-Luther, and then there was Matt Hall, and don't worry, I became a Baptist, obviously, but that had kind of this explosive effect in my own Christian life, whereas Spurgeon, it was like music that I learned to appreciate better, to savor more, and, uh, and, and, and enjoy it, but it, it wasn't quite the same trauma. How did you come to Spurgeon, and how did, how did that intersect with your own Christian life? You say, come to, come to Spurgeon? Is that, what, how did I come? Well, that sounds a bit, uh, yeah. I, I, I invited Spurgeon to be my, my personal <laughs> Baptist preacher or something like that. I'll rephrase that. <laughs> Dr. Nettles, he's always been my teacher. He will always be my teacher. Um, how did you first... It was a good question, and I'm sorry for my uh, facetious like approach. Having Carl to it. Henry up here. You know, the first time I heard of Spurgeon, it was in context. I was in high school, and I, I just remembered this. Uh, this is the first time I've thought of this in years. And your question prompted this. I began to think. Uh, first of all, I think it was just kind of music in the background. Gradually, it just sort of dawns on you something is playing, and you see it, and you begin to know something about Spurgeon. But the first time I ever heard of Spurgeon was I was having an argument with my Presbyterian friend in Brandon, Mississippi. Wayne Herring became a Presbyterian preacher, still is active, and we went all the way from kindergarten through high school together. And he had asked me one time at a Valentine banquet uh, if I believed in predestination. And I had no idea what he was talking about. And I said, why are you bringing this up at a Valentine banquet? And I said, what does that mean? He says, it means God's order decided everything. I said, of course not, that we couldn't have the Great Commission if I believed in predestination. That was it for me. And then after, he came up and he said, well, you know Spurgeon believed in predestination. I said, what do I care? Who is that? <laughs> he said, well, he's just the best Baptist preacher ever. And so that's the first I've heard of Spurgeon. And I began to sort of read. I don't, I don't know... I don't know that I ever paid any attention to it beyond that until I began to have to teach Baptist history. And then when I be began to teach Baptist history, and I, uh, that's, a long, that's a story in which I was just five minutes ahead of my classes. I'd never had a Baptist history course, and I went in with about 15 minutes worth of notes, and then by the time I got through that, I was two minutes ahead of my class. I'd give them a note, and then I'd read the next columns in my text and see if I could condense it and give it to them. Uh, that's, a t that's horrible. It's, don't anyone ever teach that way, but everyone <laughs> first semester has to. But. And when I got to the downgrade controversy, I began to get Spurgeon. And so I gradually just began to, to read Spurgeon material. The first thing, I just went to the sword and trowel, and uh, a friend of mine, Russ Bush, and I wanted to write a book about the Baptists in the Bible. And one of the things I knew, I said, well, we've got to deal with the downgrade controversy. So I just began to read all of that, and, and that got me into Spurgeon, and I've never been able to get away from it since then. So I would, I would say, after that initial mention in high school, then it was like fall of, uh, well, fall of 76. I began to teach in January of 76. By June, I'd finished the dissertation and everything. In the fall, I'd begun to work on Baptists in the Bible and ran into Spurgeon. And so from then till now, it's been a steady diet. <laughs> Music in the background is a good way to describe it. I remember Spurgeon's name being referred to, quoted in sermons as I was growing up. But the first time I can remember it being beyond that was when I was at Southwestern, <clears throat> I began in 76 when Tom started teaching there in fall of 76. And one of my professors, Curtis Vaughn, one of his colleagues, a name known to many of you, I remember the fact sticking in my mind that every day in his devotional time, he read a Spurgeon sermon. And he read through the entire Metropolitan Tabernacle pulpit that way. And that was so overwhelming to me that that, that that stuck. And so I began to read Spurgeon sermons just on occasion. That probably helped, by the way, if you only had 15 minutes worth of lecture notes. You just read a Spurgeon sermon at the beginning and <laughs> there you help go. you fill your time. Well, it'll take more than that Good to read for them. young professors to learn. Um, so I remember that is the first outstanding memory. And that prompted me, well, if, 
if this professor I admire so much thinks that much of Spurgeon, I should check into that. I don't remember when I first began reading, but I do remember then pastoring and getting everything I could by Spurgeon, and especially the Metropolitan Tabernacle Pulpit, and always consulting whether Spurgeon had preached on the text I'd preached on. So he became very early on one of my go-to commentators, if you will, one of the sources I always checked uh, when I was preaching, and I had to learn to always check him last. Uh, otherwise, I would end up basically preaching his outline and <laughs> preaching most of his sermon. Dr. Haken. You're welcome to share, but... Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I think the uh, first major memory I have of Spurgeon would have been in 1983. Um, I was asked, uh, I was teaching at Central Baptist Seminary, and I just started there a year, and we used to have a, um, uh, the faculty used to go out to represent the school. This is Central Baptist Seminary in, in Toronto, Ontario, and I was, uh, I had basically one or two sermons, and I was asked to go to a, a little village called Cottom near Windsor, and um, uh, the morning I was told that we were actually going to stay there. I had preached my one sermon, and I had to preach a sermon that afternoon, evening as well, so I was in dire straits. But I, uh, prior to going there, I had contacted uh, a historian named Arnold Dallimore, who lived there. And Dalamo was well known for having written a two-volume life of George Whitfield. And uh, during lunch at the pastor's home, uh, Dr. Dalamo phoned up, said he'd love to see me, could I come over? And I remember going into his house, and a um, number of things stick out about that, that afternoon, um, one of which had to do with the sermon. I remember halfway through the afternoon telling him, I, I don't have a sermon for this evening. Oh, he said, you'll be fine. Uh, just something trusting God, and you know, we went till we talked till six o'clock, and it was I, I don't know how I got through that evening in preaching, but he was working on his life of Spurgeon. He took me in his office, and he had the whole of Spurgeon's life uh, uh, in a huge kind of uh, board laid out about twelve, fourteen feet, all the key events, and and uh, he was going through Spurgeon's life, which came his small biography of Spurgeon. And I think I began that afternoon to realize the significance of Spurgeon uh, for Baptist history. And so that was probably my, really my first main introduction uh, to Spurgeon. So Spurgeon, let, let's just maybe review a little biography of Charles Spurgeon himself. Converted at age 15, I believe, is that right, as you recall? And called as pastor at something like age 19. Is that right, Dr. Nettles? Well, it was called Water Beach. Which is, yeah, okay, so that, we'll just say that's young. Yeah. Okay, so he's at New Park Street at 19 and pretty quickly rises to prominence. He, would it be fair to say he was kind of one of, the, he was a celebrity evangelical preacher before it was in vogue in our day and age. How, how did that reflect itself, that early fame, which... I think uh, is so, it's such a, ch a challenge for ministers in our day and age to, to wrestle with in the age of podcasts and video and, and the pressures to establish your, quote, platform. How did Spurgeon respond to in his own personal life, in his, in his walk with Christ, to just the amazingly early and accelerated fame that he found as a young minister? He knew that fame would hurt him more than criticism. Very early, he, he knew that. He says, uh, he said, when I first went to London, all of them began to kick me, but then pretty soon they began to lick me. <clears throat> and he said, I think the licking is worse than the kicking. Uh, he, he knew that this exhilaration that came from having compliments and all would be a wedge that could cause pride. He knew that pride was sinful. He knew that it would destroy him. And so he just always maintained vigilance. He believed that God gave him so many problems in order to keep him from being proud, to keep the, the accolades from destroying him. He continued to have plenty of criticism uh, in, in his life. There was a period in the middle where, where people were pretty well reconciled to Spurgeon and he didn't have a lot, but then very early and late, he just had mountains of criticism. But he, uh, he, he recognized, he just, he just knew that, that compliments and accolades would destroy him if he took it seriously, and so he constantly guarded himself against 
puffing himself up with these, this tremendous uh, publicity that he received. That's the way I see yeah. it. A lot is, a fair share has been said and written about his, his battles with melancholy, as we might put it, or even de spiritual depression. Uh, how did that play itself out? Even, was that there in the early years of his life in ministry? Was that a, something that came later? Or, or how did that intersect with his own walk with Christ, uh, his, his very public ministry? Did it, did it ebb and flow? Was it tied to some of those seasons of conflict and controversy? Or? Brethren, you ask historical questions. I'm going to defer to the historians and, you know, the, the biographer here. But as far as the spirituality, yeah, there, there was a time, especially after the, the Surrey Gardens uh, music hall incident, where he, he was, you know, it, it almost destroyed him um, mentally. And uh, he, um, he withdrew a great deal from his regular devotional practices. I mean, he was just kind of almost in a, in a stupor in one sense spiritually, yet it was through the word that, that he really sort of came out of that on the other side. As he's walking one time with, uh, with Susanna uh, in the garden and the, the inside of scripture just brought him out of it. But So in terms of a daily consistency and so forth that we see in most of his life, there were, there were those episodes, especially that's the big one, in which uh, that kept him from consistency, and then, of course, when he's in great pain with the gout and those sorts of things, that affected, at least in terms of consistency, not his, in, in those later episodes, it didn't affect his, his beliefs or his, his certainties, uh, but it did affect his consistency. Yeah, the Surrey Music Hall incident, I don't know if Dr. Nettles mentioned this earlier, was when he was preaching and some uh, yahoos up in one of the upper galleries yelled fire and uh, there was a stampede for the doors and four or five people were trampled to death in the, uh, in the uh, ensuing um, kind of uh, attempt to escape from the, uh, from the uh, building. And yeah, and he, he didn't he was know about that until he got that. home he, or until he got to the back. He kept preaching and tried to get order in the service and then he realized it just was useless and so they took him to a back room and he went into a faint and they, they, they discovered that several people had been killed and, and several sent to the hospital. And the next day, there was the newspaper articles about what a, a foolish thing this was to try to hold this meeting there. And for two weeks, as, as Don has said, he was just debilitated. Uh, I, I think that that sort of exacerbated what a, tend that he, a tendency that he had already. Because very early, as I was said today, it, just within months after his conversion, he had, was having terrible times with depression. And that's when his grandfather was trying to console him and he came out and said well he should have admonished me you know he should have upbraided me and really told me to just shake it off and get out of this uh, so I think he had some sort of constitutional givenness to it and uh, but then it, 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 he when he began to have these physical difficulties that added to it and Spurgeon knew Spurgeon knew that his his physical condition contributed to his mental depression he was very open about the fact that he was not only just hurting he was just mentally depressed and uh, he was just as open about it as he, as he could be. But I think it was a, several external factors that contributed to it that can explain it, but also an internal propensity to distress and depression. Yeah. And w the other maybe rather famous uh, other evangelical figure that, that gets a lot of coverage for his melancholy or depression is Jonathan Edwards. And uh, we could do a whole another alumni academy one time. One of you just has to write a major biography of Edwards, and then we'll do it. No pressure. Uh, but Dr. Whitney, you've you've written extensively on on Jonathan Edwards. Um, how do you assess the influence of the two men, and and particularly in the area that you work in? A lot of work has been done on Edwards. Uh, but how do, you, how do you assess the influence of the two men within kind of our own tradition and our in our theological? community, so to speak. Well, I thought you were going mainly with, or with piety, and then you <clears throat> broaden it there at the end. Um, we'll go back to piety. That's good. Okay. Piety's good. Well, I think until <clears throat> last 15 or 20 years, we would say the influence in our own, especially Baptist circles, would have been almost all Spurgeon. But Piper has, has uh, uh, brought Edwards to our attention and brought perhaps more attention to Edwards than to Spurgeon. Uh, in the last uh, 15 or 20 years or so. 
he hosted in 1990, uh, 2003 the uh, sesquicentennial or what, 300th anniversary of Edward's birth, uh, whatever that is, um, a conference there. And uh, just brought so much attention to Edwards. I know, oh, at least 10 years ago, more than 600 dissertations had been done on Jonathan Edwards, 12 on Spurgeon. Um, there's so much more attention in the academy to Edwards because he was much more, he was an academic, Spurgeon wasn't. Uh, Edwards is seen both as a theologian, as a philosopher, and so that attracts academic interest. Spurgeon was primarily a pastor and a preacher, and uh, that attracts you know, as a popular preacher, attracts less interest in the academy. But I, I would have said, certainly, in terms of the grassroots, Spurgeon's had a lot more influence because he wrote to the grassroots audience, and those are the people that today are still more attracted to him, I think. Um, <clears throat> but in terms of bringing it to, to piety, uh, <laughs> One thing I would like to emphasize is that we think of Spurgeon primarily as preacher. That's kind of the box we have him in, the greatest of all preachers, prince of preachers, all that, and he was that. But we rarely think of him as a godly man necessarily. He was an incredibly godly man, a different approach than Edwards took, Edwards being much more a uh, man of solitude, Edward, uh, Spurgeon being much more gregarious and even gregarious in his spirituality as I'll, I'll talk about tomorrow, but um, we need to emphasize Spurgeon as a, as a godly man, a different type of model in terms of private spirituality than Edwards, but an incredibly godly man, not just a preacher. And the impact that has on spirituality is that when people as evangelicals begin to write and think of examples of piety, they want to go to those that were just uh, people of private piety and who are known primarily for that and we think oh Spurgeon's not in that category he's a preacher but we should think more of Spurgeon in terms of personal godliness personal piety than we do and in fact overall I would say and as someone who did dissertation on Edwards without saying we need any less of Edwards I, I think we need more Spurgeon uh, yeah but especially here at Southern Seminary. I mean, we're, a, we're a, a Baptist institution to produce preachers. The greatest example we have, I think, humanly, is Charles Spurgeon, and, and we need, I think, more Spurgeon nowadays than Edwards. Did you have a, a, something to add there? I just think it's an interesting question, yeah. and, and I think that it's, uh, as Don has indicated, we have uh, sort of have two different uh, trajectories of what they were. Uh, Edwards was, of course, earlier than Spurgeon. He's, he's in the, dies 1758, and uh, Spurgeon's not born until 1834. 1858, he's in his third year preaching in London. And he was reading Edwards. He benefited from Edwards. He uses Edwards' vocabulary. He adopted Edwards' distinction between natural ability and moral ability. He uses Edwards' concepts, as I was mentioned today, of sensibility and the impressions on the soul. And so you have a lot of Edwards that is communicated through Spurgeon's preaching. In, in Baptist life in general, you just have, have Edwards is just, just all over the place. Now, whether it comes through Fuller or whether it comes directly through Edwards, nevertheless, you have these Edwardsian concepts, and they're the, the, the Baptist uh, theologians and writers and preachers of the early 19th century prior to Spurgeon, late uh, 18th century, uh, they are, they're, they're preaching Edwards. They're influenced by Edwards. Isaac Bacchus was greatly influenced by Edwards. John Dagg was influenced by Edwards. Basil Manley Sr. was influenced by Edwards. The Baptists probably carried on the pure Edwardsian tradition much more purely than the New England theologians did. They departed from Edwards, yeah. and the Baptists were, were arguing more for straight-line orthodoxy out of Edwards than, than the Edwardsians yeah. were. And so there is this, there is this uh, sort of ingrained Edwardsianism that comes into, into Baptist life that's hard to escape that even, Edward, that even Spurgeon himself is setting forth. And so from the standpoint of, a, of an attractive Baptist preacher and a theological preacher and a godly man, there is this the powerful influence and presence of Spurgeon, and just reading his sermons, there is an immediate attraction, there's an immediate 
uh, sort of uh, uh, an ability to understand and grasp what he's doing. To read Edwards, man, you've got to read it a bunch of times. It doesn't just immediately just a, a, appear to you what he's talking about. And, and so, uh, I mean, I'm, I just, I learn a lot about Edwards every time I teach it, and it's hard to read. I mean, no matter how many times I've read some of those things, but so there, there, there are two different trajectories, and I think as Don said, we need both of them. But if we're looking at how this is actually, how this can be preached, how this solid doctrine that is both Edwardsian and Spurgeonic can be preached, Spurgeon is the man who does the communication. I mean, if you, even if you read, you, there are beautiful passages in the Edwards, but also it's like he gets into these metaphysical things in which he, you know he's saying something great, and it's, but you've just got to wonder, how in the world could someone ever grasp this just hearing him say it? Yeah, John Plowman wouldn't have understood That's what right, John about. Plowman would have thought, what is that? <laughs> well, yeah, it's, so I think it's a good observation that Don is making, yeah. and we, need, it, he, we don't need less of Edwards. We need both of these, but we need to see that Edwards is even... Edwards is in the background yeah. of Spurgeon. Spurgeon has so much power at one level because he's absorbed the system that Edwards was, was setting forth. Yeah. And he preaches it. He popularizes it. He makes it where, where John Plowman can understand it. I like to ask people who are familiar with both, but especially who are fans of Edwards, to say, ecclesiology aside, forget ecclesiology. You're going to be a church member who sits every Sunday under one of these two men. Well, we know how it worked out in Northampton. They, yeah, they, right. vote, they voted on it. And I, don't, I, I think I've come across one person who said, who said Edwards. Uh, I mean, if you read the sermons of both, uh, I, I, Tom put it so well. I mean, it's not that we, you wouldn't you know, just be ravished by the truth as you heard it under Edwards. You agree for the privilege that would be, but to compare the two, and you have to sit under them every week. Uh, I, there's no comparison. Well, it's interesting, too, to even reflect on the fact that at the time when Spurgeon is in his rising to prominence, the Edwardsian, so to speak, counterpart of his on the, in, in the United States would have been Henry Ward Beecher, I think. You could say, at least in terms of public visibility, prominence, his oratorical skills, and he could trace his theological genealogy, so to speak, back to Edwards, in a sense. But the substance of their doctrinal preaching couldn't be any different, right? That's, a, that's an excellent observation. And, and Spurgeon makes comments on Henry Ward Beecher quite frequently. Thinks he's a marvelously talented person, brilliant, said, but, but he is, he's no minister of the gospel. Yeah. Well, if we, we've, there's a great biography of Henry Ward Beecher. There's a lot of attention given to Beecher because of his Edwardsian lineage, so to speak. Maybe we need some more of that attention given to, as you've pointed out, to, to Spurgeon. Um, another question for the three of you. Uh, there's a lot of attention in evangelical life these days, and wonderfully so, to ministry in cities, right? Uh, we hear very, I mean, the, the data is the data, but the, the data on urbanization globally and, and population shifting to the cities and this renewed call for evangelicals to give concerted effort and attention, even our own North American Mission Board, giving concerted attention to church life, ministry, and pastoral ministry in urban centers in North America. Well, Charles Spurgeon was in the city before it was hip and cool, uh, and he functioned and served in a, in a very unique context. Dr. Nellis, your biography helps kind of situate him in this reality, but he's ministering, right, in, in a very critical moment in British history and in, in the rise of kind of industrial Britain, uh, the expansion of the empire, and in a particular, not just in a, in a British context, but a very even unique context right there in the, the neighborhood he's in in London. Can you explain a little bit how did um, Spurgeon maybe give for us a model or did he, or were there things that we might be warned against by his, his, his ministry, but did it, does he give us a model in any way that evangelicals can learn from today about what it means to carry out pastoral ministry in the life of the church in a major urban uh, context? Well, I think probably a number of things. Um, he's very concerned for the uh, poor, so the orphanage that he establishes, uh, so much so that he actually uh, gives instructions that when he dies, he wants to be buried uh, on the orphanage uh, there, which eventually I think has around 600 orphans in there. So the sort of poor that are generated in an urban setting that in a local village setting, they would probably be taken in by families. 
Uh, prostitution is a major problem. We, we tend to think of Victorian England with Victorian morals, but to, to a significant degree, some of that's a facade. And uh, prostitution is a major, major issue in London. And uh, Spurgeon has a significant uh, ministry uh, speaking against that, etc. Uh, the Cole Portage ministry, where he's uh, producing cheap versions of his books. Uh, people, obviously, who are in industrial England don't have the resources to buy. So he's trying to ch produce literature at a fairly cheap level uh, that they can buy this material. Uh, and then the fact that um, he's got a church of uh, that morning and evening, he's got 6,000 there, uh, and yet he plants between 75 to 80 churches. If you go to London today and uh, you look at the founding uh, year of uh, a Baptist church, and if it's in the period of Spurgeon's ministry from 1856 uh, to 1891, when he's active in London, it's almost definitely been founded by, by Spurgeon. Um, and the area where he is in London, it's, the worst, it's one of the worst areas of London. It's uh, the South Thames. Uh, today it's a very bad area, Brixton, right next door to Brixton, Southwark. Um, it's interesting, I've rarely been afraid in a, in a, a New York, sorry, in, a, in, a, in an American town when I'm walking. I grew up in England. Uh, the one time I was really afraid for my life was walking home after being at the tabernacle and uh, the present pastor Peter Masters requires his elders and deacons to live in Southwark and uh, or next door Bri Brixton and they had the Brixton race riots back in the 1990s and it, I realized I was in a very very bad area and it was scary uh, it was somewhat better in those days. You didn't have the racial mix, but uh, the south side of the Thames has always been a very, very difficult area. Well, and he's ministering right as it's booming. I think uh, this mm -hmm. sounds a little nerdy to cite this, but I think the, the rail line comes into Elephant and Castle in like 1863. So, like it, so the tube obviously comes later, but there's the, the growth, there are waves of immigration, all those things. And the know. immigrants normally come into that area first. They mm -hmm. come into Southwark where he is, and then once they make good, they move on. And so it's a very, very difficult area in terms of uh, um, financially, in terms of poverty, crime. He could have moved. He could easily have moved north of the Thames into a much wealthy area, or uh, east, he should, could have gone east over to the area which, which is called Richmond, uh, but he stays put. And so it's a very, very difficult area, and I think I think part of that is the desire to reach the poor. The pastor's college is designed to train men who don't have the benefit of, of a baccalaureate education. All of the schools, Baptist schools in England, Regent's Park, uh, Bristol, all required a baccalaureate education to go there. He did not. And so he's got a definite desire to reach the poor. And that's what in industrialization had uh, made Britain the, the, the most uh, a powerful nation in the world at the time, but in doing so, it had uh, alienated and impoverished large swathes of people whose lives a hundred years earlier had been in fairly secluded um, um, villages where there was a sense of, of, of a heritage and a past. They would go to the parish church, their great-grandparents were all buried there. Now they're in the midst of London uh, with its smog, uh, its filth, its grime, its crime, and just the alienation of that. And Spurgeon, uh, not only the tabernacle, but he's got eight, 75 to 80 of these churches he plants around the city that are beacons. And so I think Spurgeon is a fabulous model today of how to reach a, a large urban industrialized center. I think that, that's well said. I just spoke on this very thing over at this, uh, this banquet that Spurgeon found his, his own uh, sensitivity to sociological issues as a foundation for benevolent ministry combined with his understanding of the gospel. And, and everything that you said is what I've discovered in, in reading the way Spurgeon talked about London. When he ended his, when, at the close of his life, he really hated London. He, he stayed there and he continued to minister, but... He, he said on one occasion, if someone had a chance to move to London, they were living in the country. He said the best way to, to save your life is to stay out of London, stay in the country. 
uh, and he, he was just so uh, upset with the, the language and the filth and the, and the uh, prostitution and the gin houses and all of that. It was so destructive. But he continued working, and eventually they were, they were, not only did he establish these churches, which were fundamental to what he believed and needed to be gospel light in all of these places, and he would go to the hard places, the ugly places, to establish his churches, but he also had, there were 66 different benevolent organizations that, that had their, sort of their home at the Metropolitan uh, Tabernacle, and there were many of them with these aid societies was, was a part of the name of them. And so he was trying to penetrate the darkness. He worked at it, and, and there's no telling what would have happened if it hadn't have been for Spurgeon's not only his evangelistic ministry, but his benevolent uh, ministry. Their activities were, weren't there from like 7 in the morning till 11 at night. It was open. That's yeah. tabernacle thing is always going on. And I think it's often forgotten. We, we think of these crowds that were always there, and we think it's purely the attraction of his speaking, which was so much of it, especially those who would you know, cross the river to Charlie uh, people here. But uh, th these 66 different ministries that were number one taking, they, they weren't just social, they were taking the gospel to people, seeing people converted. They were also, these 66 different ministries, bringing people to hear Spurgeon who they knew would preach the gospel. So these, this penetration into yeah. the community, I think that he spoke of, is, is a big part of the answer. And what's, uh, I think, just to bring it up to the modern day, uh, by 1970-72, the tabernacle was down to about 14 people. It had been destroyed during the war by incendiary bombs, rebuilt after the war to house 1,200 instead of the 5,000 it could. But during the uh, 50s and 60s, because of liberal theology, it declined down to about a dozen people. And then in 1970, Martin Lloyd-Jones recommended a young man whom he had mentored named Peter Masters to go there. Um, Peter Masters uh, is uh, strongly um, fundamentalist and separatistic to some degree, but he has done a tremendous work there. Um, he's rebuilt the church. The church is probably somewhere on a typical Sunday morning, eight, nine hundred. Doesn't sound a lot, but that's big in, in London. And they have an enormous number of ministries. I mean, it's now one of the poorest areas of London and one of the most violent. And if you go there, it's a cross-section uh, multiculturally, and it's a, uh, he, has done, he and his wife have done a fabulous job. His wife is um, uh, in some ways a quintessential uh, English lady uh, who you think would spend most of her time in little tea parties, and she's an absolute dynamo. She's created a whole Sunday school material, and they've done a tremendous job in reaching uh, the homeless, the poor, the various uh, immigrants who come in. And if Spurgeon were to come back today, I mean, he would be thrilled in, in, that, in that sense by, by what God has done there. Well, there is this gap, though, right, from when Spurgeon dies, and is he in France when he dies, I think? Mm -hmm. But when, when he dies to the election or the appointment of Peter Masters as pastor, there's that significant gap of time. And that raises maybe the last question I'd ask before we turn it over to, to these folks, and uh, so be preparing your question. But these are the questions that I want to ask, and I've got the microphone, so I get the last one that I want to ask. How, it seems to be a recurring challenge in prominent pulpits, and not just in recent evangelical life, but all the way going back, that after a prominent ministry, it is incredibly traumatic for a church, whether you want to call it succession or, or, or continuing on, kind of that legacy of theological integrity, faithful preaching, evangelism, you know, all those, those marks of a healthy church that we would affirm. And it seems to be that Spurgeon and, and the Metropolitan Tabernacle is another instance of, and you could look at other, maybe we, we could mention Dr. Jones again, Lloyd Jones again, of congregations that were prominent, had very visible public ministries, and for one reason or another, after a, it seemed to be that perhaps there was no preparation made for life after Lloyd Jones, life after Spurgeon. Uh, am I wrong there? And, and what, what lesson think, is there to be learned? Yeah, I think there is significant preparation made after his death. There is a major split that takes place in 1895. I remember going through the minute books at that period, and uh, probably three to 4,000 people leave uh, in around 1895, 1896. And I'm think, I think that's when A.C. Dixon was there. No. 
Okay, I'm no, wrong. No, oh, that that was it was later. That was later. it was okay. yeah. The, his his son succeeded him. As, but there was as, there was AC Dixon was there. As, that was uh, still a couple of people down. Okay. So there yeah. is a there is a split. And then even during the time of A.C. Dixon, the A.C. Dixon gets a lot of press because he was not quite in the spirit of Spurgeon, though he right. was basically theologically sound, but he was an American fundamentalist. And but the elders just sort of held things off and waited, and then he was succeeded by Spurgeon man. Dixon was, but but Thomas Spurgeon came and had a 15-year ministry there and a very powerful and significant ministry where the 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 attendance did not fall off much at all. Eventually, Archibald Brown also became pastor there, who was one of Spurgeon's favorite men and who Wasn't was Wasn't Brown at East London Tabernacle? East Tabernacle. London Tabernacle had been there. And, and, had, and then had he does nurtured, come to the Metropolitan. And he comes to the Metropolitan okay. Tabernacle. And, and, and Ian Murray's written a book about Spurgeon's successor, Archibald right. Brown, but he was about three pastors down the road. And so you do have this A.C. Dixon time when it was not in that Spurgeonic tradition, but so there are about three the, different pastors the in there, plate. three out of four that succeeded Spurgeon that were Spurgeonic. And it's not until you get, uh, I think, into the late 30s. Well, you've it, got Tide, Tideman Chilvers in the 20s and 30s. He's yep. Spurgeonic. It's that's not right. until you get to the 40s yeah. that you probably start. So that's good 50 years. Yeah, and so... So, so really, uh, I know Peter Masters does, does not like this chapter that Ian Murray has after the Forgotten Spurgeon on the aftermath. He says it just, it's just wrong. It just leaves the wrong impression as to what happened. At the time, he focuses on this one episode of Dixon, and he said that in, in the way he represents it, it was not the church. The church was very kind and loving and put up with him, but it was not... They were just waiting for him to go on, and when they went on, they replaced him with, a, with another Spurgeon man. In the so, 40s, they come back into the Baptist Union. Yes. And Spurgeon had come, and that was deadly at that point. And then there was a, an Eric Hayden in the 60s who loved Spurgeon, but uh, he was a dreadful pastor. And that's when you start, it starts to go down, and then uh, Peter Masters <coughs> comes in 70. So it's a bit different from Lloyd-Jones. With Lloyd Jones, he retires in '68, uh, '71. Glenn Owens left, and then they call R.T. Kendall, and that's disastrous. And within within five years of Kendall being there, there's only about a hundred in the church. A so man who cannot well be described as Spurgeonic. No. Although that adjective may it all be said of you that you were Spurgeonic. That's a great adjective. Well, we do have. But I, one, look, yeah, it, it is very different. I mean. The idea of succeeding a man like Spurgeon, I mean, it's, it's you know, uh, or Lloyd-Jones, and we could easily probably think of three or four men today. I mean, how do you, how do you step into such a pastor after? So. With fear and trembling, I think. Uh, what questions do you have? I think Raymond may have a microphone, maybe, uh, if you need it. If, if not, you can just project. But... Uh, do you want to give it a shot, brother? There, in, uh, yes, sir. I was just wondering, since we have so many historians on the panel, about the spiritual health of Britain seemed to start declining not so many decades after, or even in the midst of the end of the Spurgeon's career, and we're seeing some of the same parallels in America. I, yeah, I think our situation is quite dissimilar in some respects. Um, by the 1890s, Spurgeon's theology was out of vogue. Uh, men like Joseph Parker, even Alexander McLaren in Manchester, who had 6,000 in his pulpit, uh, 6,000 in his church, um, he, had, he no longer believed in the historical Adam and Eve. Uh, he didn't believe that the acceptance of certain elements of liberal criticism would affect Christian piety. Um, the, the vogue was away in evangelical circles from Spurgeon's Calvinism. Um, and many of the big-name preachers would not have shared Spurgeon's, Spurgeon's theology. Uh, 
you have the impact of the First World War, which is absolutely devastating. Um, so, for instance, the 1904-1905 Welsh Revival, uh, large numbers of the young men converted in those churches were killed 14 years later in the trenches. So there are towns in Wales where 75% of the men went away because they were drafting uh, between 18 and 45 by the end of the war. And uh, 50 or 60%, some of them, didn't come back. If you ever go to Wales or England and you see the lists of the dead on the, on the, the, the little you know, the town center cenotaphs, that's sometimes, you don't know it, that, that's sometimes 50 to 60% of the men between 18 and 45. So a large numbers of evangelicals were wiped out. Um, and then obviously the advent of Marxism and communism, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I think our situations are very different. The reform faith seems to be, I mean, if you look at all the significant preachers today, those who are making a, a large impact, that, that virtually most of them embrace reform theology of one sort or another. I think that would have been a rarity in, uh, in Spurgeon's day. I can't think of, especially apart from a few Scottish men like Horatius Bonner, uh, even a man like Alexander White who claimed to be reformed, I mean, there's major holes in his reformed theology. And um, I would hope that we've had a century behind us uh, when we've seen the death that liberal theology brings. They didn't have that to some degree. Uh, they were at the first end of it. So I think, I think our situations are quite different in some ways, but uh, historians are not good, pro at least this historian is not a good <laughs> prognosticator of the future. Yeah. So, I think another difference, I mean, culturally I think there are parallels, and it's, it's uh, it, moral issues that become implanted within any kind of population appeals to the fallen nature of man and we will find ways to embrace those things that please us and when we are unregenerate and more and more justification can be given within a rational framework for just pleasing ourselves we will gravitate to it no matter what the cultural uh, issues have have been and so I think that there are parallels there but also when you have a state church situation as England had and as Europe has, that has an eventual devastating, corrupting, sinister effect on genuine piety and zeal uh, in religion. And Spurgeon recognized this. Spurgeon believed America was far superior to England in the potential for evangelism and missions and genuine spiritual growth because the churches were unfettered by this inherited authority of a state church. They had to make their way through the preaching of the gospel. Uh, and so he, he recognized that. He, he thought that America was much better off even in, in his day. Um, the, as I think as, as, as Dr. Haken and Michael pointed out, this this uh, t terrible impact of liberal theology that they were celebrating because, as you said, they didn't have the background of the devastation that it actually brings about. They thought that it was going to help. They thought they were salvaging Christianity, that the, the Enlightenment, the rationalistic age is going to destroy Christianity unless we could, we could embrace it and that we, could, we could make it sort of, uh, make it as a part of what the Christian faith was and any time we begin to redefine Christianity in terms of what we think is the prevailing culture and what is going to be popular, uh, you you corrupt it. Spurgeon knew that very well. He he argued against it. He knew it was wrong. But the Baptist Union went that direction, and with with that, basically all dissent the the, the groups that were not a part of the state church they get sucked into to liberalism, and so there is very little conscience gospel conscience left uh, in England after, after World War I. It's just, uh, America didn't go quite that quickly. We're on the verge of it. But, but of course, you know, our, our concern shouldn't really be for 
America. It's for the church in the world. It's what God is doing with his, his people. It's, I mean, we do want our country to be righteous, and we want it, to, and there's much about that, but we're, we're still, we, we don't need to say we need revival to save America. That's not what it's about. We, 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 we want the gospel to flourish wherever it is, no matter what country it, it is. Uh, I think you, sir, right here in the checkered shirt, you had your hand up earlier. That's a that's a very good question. Um, he he was enormously widely read. Uh, to what degree w uh, individual fathers he would have known, you'd have you'd have to do an extensive search through the the available material in the Sword and the Trowel, the, uh, the Metropolitan Tabernacle. I, I I what I can say for definitive is this: is a few years ago we were one of my spirituality seminars. One of the students did. Um, uh, uh, Spurgeon's use of Bernard of Clairvaux. That's what he suggested as his topic. And I really tried to dissuade him. I thought, I, I don't think you're going to find much. He came up with a very fine paper. And a fine paper because he found material. And I was very, very surprised. And uh, that's a medieval figure. So my suspicion is that if you were to choose certain of the fathers, like Augustine, uh, you would probably be uh, quite uh, favorably impressed with the amount that Spurgeon read in them. Um, he was certainly widely read in the Reformers, the Puritans, uh, and uh, church history since the Reformation. Uh, the, I was very surprised to find him that this, he, had, he had a significant amount, uh, comparatively speaking, to say about Bernard of Clairvaux. Um, I, I, I can't say yay or nay. My suspicion is that if you went through and searched for definitely Augustine, you would find a significant amount of material there. Sounds like one of those dissertations that Dr. Whitney yeah. was calling, inviting earlier. Uh, yes, Paul, right there. You've talked about some of the views that Spurgeon had on America. And is there enough to talk about the relationship between D.L. Moody and Spurgeon and perhaps the influence they had on each other? Well, just to answer the question simply, yes, there is. There's a lot of material. They had a lot of correspondence with each other. Moody and Sankey were at, at, at his funeral. Sankey sang. Uh, he defended uh, Moody's preaching in, in England when other people were criticizing it. He went and he, he encouraged his people to go to Moody's campaigns. He himself went when he could and he would preach in different places where Moody was holding these meetings. He said he wished he had time and energy to do it uh, more. Uh, there was correspondence between them. Moody t spent time just to read Spurgeon's sermons. He was, he was saturated with Spurgeon's sermons. He credits Spurgeon with, with, in a sense, teaching him how to preach and how to, how to reach common uh, people. So there, there, there would be a lot of material for a pretty, uh, at least a good essay on the relationship between Moody and Spurgeon. Yes, sir, right here in the front. as an actual pastor, when we look at Spurgeon, you have a man who's not just a preacher, but is more, you know, he's with the people, he's speaking to the people, while Edwards more was kind of over their heads. And I'm, I'm curious regarding, I guess, our modern time, as you were mentioning, where there's been so much more focus, primarily because of Piper towards Edwardian theology, what effect you see that, I guess, again, kind of predicting <laughs> the future of God, and how it relates to with pastors and young men that are going into ministry now, whether or not you think there's going to be a kind of missing the people, as is more of an intellectual faith and more of a kind of a high and worthy in theology and not much Spurgeonist type, you know, in action. I, go ahead. <laughs> in terms of pastoral ministry, no pun intended, and we could all take this a long way, but Spurgeon was much more well-rounded 
as, as a pastor <clears throat> than Edwards. Now, people would argue academically, uh, Edwards' more superior mind. There's one edition, 1870s, of the Encyclopedia Britannica that says Edwards is the greatest mind America has ever produced. It's amazing when you think, who said that? I would argue that in terms of intelligence that Spurgeon was just as brilliant as Edwards, but a different kind of brilliance. I mean, for example, who's smarter, Einstein or Mozart? Completely different kind of intelligence. I, I think Spurgeon's ability to speak visually, he didn't tell many stories, but he just spoke in, in pictures. We would say of Pilgrim's Progress, which he read a hundred times, we would say, Bunyan just filled that book with the Bible. Spurgeon said you cut Bunyan anywhere and his blood is Bibline. He made up a word, but it, but it worked. And he just seemed to speak like that in, in, in pictures. And so I think that, that gives evidence of an incredible intelligence and brilliance as much as Edwards. But in terms of people skills, though, there, there's no comparison. Edwards was often... Uh, uh, perceived as brittle, as aloof. He was painfully shy and, and, and with a wide group of people. And he could be very uh, talkative with other ministers, like-minded people, but he couldn't relate to shopkeepers, farmers, homemakers, and those were the people in town. Those are the people he had to minister to. So he was uncomfortable. Spurgeon was comfortable with everyone, and everyone loved him. He was so good with people. That, that's what made him such you know, a better pastor. He interviewed personally almost everyone who came from membership, right? He knew almost all of their names. Uh, and you know, there's a legendary story about Edwards, which I doubt that is true, but it, it was pro born out of propensities probably of Edwards that uh, Edwards is out walking and, and he meets a young boy. He's like five years old says, whose boy are you? And he tells him and so forth. Well, a few minutes later, they cross paths again. He says, whose boy are you? And he says, the same boy, you know, same father I had, you know, five minutes ago. Um, so Spurgeon pastorally was just hands down far better. He just, his people skills. And I, that's why I think in the seminary especially we need more Spurgeon and less Edwards because, as you said, it can tend to produce a too academic approach to pastoral ministry and not a, a people-centric approach to ministry. And, and Spurgeon was a people person far more than I am. And, and that's one of the things I think we all need to learn from him is his ability with people, yet this incredible mind, incredible preacher, great godliness, but he was so good at conveying all of that and relating to people, and we need that so desperate. I was, uh, oh, sorry, I was just, very quickly, I was just involved in writing a local, uh, ch history of a local church not far from where I live, Hester, Hesperville Baptist Church, a part of Cambridge, Ontario. And uh, one of the older brothers in the church, he's in his 80s, his grandfather was a friend of Spurgeon. Last name was Lazell. And he has a letter that Spurgeon wrote to him. Uh, Spurgeon was at a prayer meeting where he heard the grandfather praying for his five-year-old son. And Spurgeon went home and wrote a letter to the five-year-old boy, uh, Arthur, telling him he'd heard his father praying for him and encouraged him to, to write there and then, as soon as his parents had read in the letter, to go up to his room and call on the Lord Jesus and be saved. And uh, this brother uh, treasures this letter, obviously, because that, like that. that was his father. Thousands of letters. And there's, it's, it's just, again, a, just a, an element of Spurgeon's ability to reach, you know, the common person and the little child in this case. All of that is true, but I've still got this uncomfortable feeling in my chest. I think that we're pressing Edwards down. I was waiting for this. Oh, um, come on. How, how could someone write... I wasn't saying... I was just... I was saying something about Spurgeon. I know, I know. That, I, I agree. And I've, I've seen letters and read these letters in the inquiry books. I spent time with the inquiry books there and the, the, the way he trained his, his elders to talk to these people that were coming to inquire is great. But, but how could a man write a narrative of surprising conversions in Northampton know 300 people and describe all of these conversions and look at the propensities of all of them and all the different emotions they had and how all of them were saved and they come, the manner of conversion various yet, the, yet bearing a great analogy. He knows all of these distinctions and all of these differences without having counseled virtually every one of them. He was the only pastor. He didn't have other people capable of doing that. I think, I think that Edwards was deeply involved in the lives of his people. I, I of think course, that, that is... 
that is a charge during the 17, late 1740s that Edwards didn't visit his congregation. Well, he told them that he wasn't a visitor. But he said, anytime you want to come right. to me, it's fine. They, well, but see, and they, <laughs> the, 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 and narratives, they the narratives of conversions, well, you just, all these stories, they lined up at his door during the two waves of the revival. Yeah. He said, I'm not a visitor, but you all know where I live. You know, it's in walking distance of everyone, and so you're all welcome. And he repeated that. Well, and I don't he, think he Spurgeon went around visiting he, his he congregation either. Well, he, but he meant that, and people would line up for his counsel, and he spent a lot of time with them during the revivals or any time they came. But outside of that, I, I, there was a distance, and he admitted that he was uncomfortable in small talk. And, and Samuel Hopkins, his first biographer, says uh, of his friendship with Jonathan Edwards, and Ed, he lived with Edwards for a year and a half, was mentored by Edwards. He said, once you got to know him, as a friend, he was the dearest of friends. But again, there were other ministers it's, it's and so breaking forth. Breaking that barrier with Edwards. He was intimidating. Was I mean, he, was, he never walked into a room. He wasn't the smartest person in the room. And in Northampton, he was always the best educated man in the room. But Spurgeon, we have these, you know, these countless stories, not only these letters, but the, the orphans and going to the bedside when they're dying. And he would go yeah, out Christmas of his way. Parties. He loved their Christmas parties. He's like a child talking about getting all the stuff ready for their Christmas parties. Oh, and giving them the pennies and so forth. And how about early on during the plague? And he would go to their yeah. bedsides and so forth. And so within the limits of the largest evangelical church in the world and all these other demands on his time, he would reach out to people like that. He would make those efforts, and people knew it, and they felt comfortable. They, they, children loved being with him. People loved being in his presence. And you just read none of that with Edwards. Now, when he, Edwards was with him, it was quality conversation. And he pressed them on the things of God. And he made the most of those conversations. But people had to come to him for them. And there was never a sense, I think, of, that, uh, of friendliness to them. Yeah. Do you think some of this, this is a uh, good discussion. Do you think <laughs> some of this is, uh, and some of it's personality. It's not, it's not, it's not, it's it's not theory of what pastoral almost, ministry yeah. sure. is. Uh, and it's not necessarily when you're involved in the conversation who, who's more effective in discerning what kind of, the, uh, what kind of spiritual problem a person has. Um, Spurgeon, during the last at least 20 years of his, of his ministry, was gone 30% of the time from the field. He wasn't even there 30% of the time. But he writes letters from Mentone that are wonderful pastoral letters. And we have the letters and we read them, but he wasn't there 30% of the time. He was sick. Uh, and he didn't get run off, but They Edwards knew got he run loved off. them. Even in Mentone, yeah. they knew he loved them, and they didn't feel like Edwards loved them, I think. Yeah, because he tried to change Stoddard's view of the Lord's Supper. Well, there, there are a lot of reasons, but the, the, there was a distance. <laughs> he just, he couldn't identify with them, and he, he would admit that. And uh, he handled things poorly, you know, the bad book oh, incident. Yeah, he yeah, made so many people skill mistakes, and you just don't read of many things like that with, with Spurgeon. Yeah, Spurgeon said that he was like the captain of a ship on which a Jonah. He said if he ever found a Jonah on his, on his ship, he'd throw him overboard. Lovingly and tenderly, but he would throw him overboard, so... <laughs> He was we, the captain of the ship. We are nearly out of time. Yeah. We do have one brother in the back who's been patiently, he's going to persevere to the end here and has maybe our, our final question for the evening. Dr. Mills, uh, in your book, connecting back to your statement just a few minutes ago about uh, Spurgeon and Edwards, you talk about the Spurgeon being very intimidating. Yeah. Uh, Edwards was not Uh, there are probably some aspects of it I don't feel confident to, to speak to as to exactly what, what Spurgeon's view was of how England fit into redemptive history. I think Spurgeon, though, was he, was, he, he rightly understood that political and religious backgrounds make, a di make differences in cultures. 
and that some cultures are better than other cultures. Uh, cultures that are honest and hardworking and that respect life are better than cultures that are filled with thieves and loafers and uh, are murderers. It's th those are just different cultures. And the things that make those cultures different are the, the, those values that are adopted publicly on the basis of some way that people are, can be convinced that one worldview is better than another. And so where the gospel has been freely preached for generations, a culture has developed that has certain values connected with it, certain propensities of the culture that have been built into it because of a long succession of preaching those things. And so he did view English culture overall as a better culture, although he recognized that there were sometimes there were, there were selfish reasons for it and there were, there were things underhanded, but, but the culture had become so um, oriented towards certain values because of these decades and even centuries of the presence of the gospel that it made it com very distinct from other cultures. So I don't think that he is saying that there is necessarily in the covenant of God a particular favorite country that, that God has or anything like that. It is the outworking <clears throat> of, the, of the power of, of, of preaching that creates these, these differences uh, in the way countries develop their, their culture. This may be a fitting conclusion back to this other thing. You talked about Spurgeon being gone 30% of the time. At one point he tried to resign, didn't he? Saying, I'm not here six months of the year. And wasn't one, was one of the elders who said, you remember? Having you, having you six months is better than having anyone else for the whole time. Yes, yes. <laughs> because... Yeah, they loved him. Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and they fired Edwards, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been fired, too, so it's. Uh... <laughs> well, that, I guess, is as fitting of a way as any to uh, end the uh, discussion, <laughs> talking about firing. Um, I, I just, would add, th these men have all had long days. Obviously, Dr. Nettles has been teaching all day. You have a full day to, uh, tomorrow. I, I know you're looking forward to that. But would you just show your appreciation and gratitude to these men for their investment in you?